My name is Tamara L. Shade. Welcome to this special presentation of the 2018 Conversations series. Conversations is a graduate seminar based in the MFA Visiting Artist Program. It provides a unique opportunity to hear dynamic and influential artists and cultural workers from various domains speak. It provides seminar participants, as well as members of the public, a chance to interchange with the guests and with each other on core questions in contemporary art. I invite you to join us for the talks over the course of the semester here in BA 114. Tonight, we're in for a huge treat, a special screening of California artist Marnie Weber's first feature-length film, The Day of Forevermore, to be followed by a brief Q&A. Uh, practice, Marnie's practice encompasses performance, film, video, sculpture, collage, music, and costuming generating her own mythology of creatures and female characters her works offer narratives of passion, transformation, and discovery. Marnie's uncanny worlds exist in a realm between fantasy and reality and invite viewers into an exploration of the subconscious. Using fairy tale like imagery, she consistently places women in transformative and magical roles and in positions of power. She ha uh, has had solo shows, video screenings, and performances throughout the US, Asia, and Europe, and a retrospective of her work showed at Magasin uh, in Grenoble, France, and uh, Mamco in Geneva. Before we settle in for Marnie's 20-minute presentation on her work before the filmmaking hat was donned, right? Um, I'd like to thank Jason McKechnie. Thanks for all of your tremendous work on the screening and also the huge, I've heard it described as wild so far, the wild massive group exhibition at Art Muir, which opens tomorrow. This is a very anticipated exhibition and you guys are all cordially invited to the opening tomorrow. We'll remind you at the end of the, the night about it. Uh, so thank you, Jason, for all your work on this and Francois for a bit of brokering Yes. before it all happened. Um, and also, in their absence, I'd like to thank Art Muir uh, for, for their work as well, and Never Apart. So, without further ado, please welcome Marnie. Thank you, Tamara. Oh yeah, that's great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm really happy to be here. This will be the first time I've actually shown my PowerPoint before the movie, so it's a great opportunity for me to shape everything that went into my first feature film with previous work. I've, as the, Tamar said, nicely said in the introduction, I've been involved in music and performance and costume making and sculpture and installation now for about 30 years, and I want to point out a few things going along the way that will help you understand the movie. Um, one is that I've done, I've done all the music myself in the film, all the whole soundtrack in various, you'll see some names of different bands, but those are all my bands that I've created, and they sometimes are conceptual bands, sometimes they're fictitious bands, um, but I'll talk a bit more about that as we go. Uh, the first band I was in, which was more of a collaboration, this would have been uh, 1979, 1980, I had the lofty aspiration of being nothing but a bass player in a band. And that was out, out of art school. So I, I was in a band for about five years. We toured, we made records, we played for beer in bars. We really didn't get anywhere, but um, I learned a few things from that experience. And I think the most important thing that I learned from that experience was um, to do it yourself and to not wait for others to give you an opportunity to show your work. Because we would walk into bars and say, can we play here for free? And also another thing that I got involved in is handmade records um, with each cover being unique. With when I was in this band, The Party Boys, that center piece that you see there, um, that was an addition of 500 and each cover was a different color. And so that I brought into my work as I became a performance artist, a solo performance artist. 
When the band broke up, I decided it would be nice. This was the 80s, performance was in its heyday. I started to take on different characters, partly, mostly because of um, uh, stage fright, and it was easier for me. This is Coquette, circus girl, impaled through her pony. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I've played an old woman, and you will see me playing an old witch in the film, wearing a full mask. Uh, here, Outer Space Alien. These are just some of my characters. Happy. Um, these are some of the records I put out over the years, which I did three solo records, each with an addition of 100, and each one had a different cover. And so my thinking when I do a LP with a different cover each is to remind people that the importance of handmade items, that, that art is really not throwaway, it's not digital, it's not just Instagram as much as it's becoming to seem as if it is, but the hand of the artist is still very important to me. In, um, I, after a bit, I began to start taking these characters into Super 8 films. I was not a filmmaker. I had been to art school. I never tried um, making films. I never even had a class in films. And um, so I got a Super 8 camera and just started dressing up and having my husband um, film these characters in different situations. This one, uh, Destiny and Blow Up Friends, is actually going to be shown at Art Mirror. So you'll have plenty of time to see it, and you could see the development from a 10-minute film um, into what will eventually then become 25 years later, my first feature. Here's another uh, character from one of my films. I, I make the costumes myself primarily and um, get help with the construction and the building of the sets and the props. Uh, um, in, I would say it was 19, uh, I can't quite remember the year, was it, I think it was 2005, I started the Spirit Girls. I was thinking one day, there really aren't enough girl bands that are dead, and so I <laughs> created this band of spirits, and um, they came back to life to perform, and we started with a rock opera of my songs. I'm always the one in the middle with the red hair. And that branched into four films, uh, Spirit Girl films, telling the story of the Spirit Girl characters. Here we are with the Western song. This is when the lead character um, leaves the band because she's tired of the responsibility. And she gets involved in a, a circus channeling spirits for these clowns. And so then I was um, trying to decide how would one show this film in a context of a gallery. And so a lot of new, excuse me, a lot of new collages and um, sculptural works were born. I think of these sort of gi as giant toys like when you're a child and you go back um, and you think everything was so huge and then when you realize it was just small. So these animals are created from taxidermy <coughs> foam forms that I got online and then the uh, uh, croutons and the uh, different, they're adapted with different ways of doing it sculpturally. And then we've got some ghost clowns in the middle which are simple sheets. I try to keep everything fairly handmade and low tech, and um, and, and that includes <coughs> the collages. These collages actually were not done digitally. The uh, the background photo and the rooster was photographed, and then I would photograph myself in the position that I thought would fit. Then I would cut myself out of paper and glue it on because I, again I wanted to keep the feeling of the handmade work. Here's the spirit girls um, in having a picnic and a big bronco rushes through. It's a bit, you know, it's like a diorama. And I wanted to capture moments of the spirit girls' uh, lives as spirits in sort of a poised um, as a drama as if something psychological is happening subconsciously. 
here they are ascending back up into where they came from. Uh, here the lead character becomes a scarecrow to hide um, on her runaway journey. Here's the great circus fire, sort of born from the lead spirits girl's captivity. Um, again, it's a diorama that I lit on fire and then um, uh, hand cut the characters and placed in the photograph. Each one unique. At one point I realized that the spirit girls still hadn't spoken and they weren't going to because their mouths didn't move. And so I had ventriloquist dolls. I found somebody who knew how to um, cast a ventriloquist doll head and I got the bodies online. They're actually mannequin bodies and then made uh, matching costumes. And then when the spirit girls finally got their voices, they ended up in a bar telling stupid barroom jokes. <laughs> so you can't control everything. Here they are mounted in a gallery on the wall. Some of them, their, their adventures. Oh, one's bad. Here they are going back out to sea. I also have been very much involved in clowns for many years. I, sim simple idea, uh, when a clown dies, all the clowns in real life must come to the funeral dressed as clowns. And so I made this installation, Giggle of Clowns. Mannequins with the um, heads were um, old men and old women masks painted, put on the mannequins, and then the clothes were either clown clothes or stuff I got at thrift stores. And then the centerpiece is this dead spirit girl. And then as the audio, it is an audio of clowns laughing and crying. Man again, a, a mannequin covered in, in flowers that were hardened. There's a close up. I usually spend about nine months on each installation or film. A lot of pre-prep with the costumes. Um, some of the sculptures had then been commissioned on a large scale. This one was made um, it, it by, in China, and the body carved from a, a renewable source tree and then added the, the costuming later. Uh, this one was carved in marble. After this experience, I realized I was never going to do that again because I wasn't that kind of an artist. Um, it was nice to send my design off and have it come back, but it was not me at all. This is a, a installation I did. A lot of my life is revolves around shipping, and so um, I had the challenge of how do you do a big installation overseas with limited budget for shipping. So I made all the, the masks, in the costumes, packed them up, sent them UPS, got there, the, bought the, got the boat on eBay, did the background mural painted, and um, away they go. That's happy-go-lucky. That's a different character representing me in the back of the boat with her monsters. I'm very much um, involved in monsters now because they, they have a great <coughs> reference to the subconscious and what's going on in the dream state. When you see the film, you'll, you'll realize I'm trying to sh get a point between reality and the dream state and to get that sort of uneasy feeling like maybe you're lucid dreaming. Another challenge I have is how do you show a film in a gallery situation and not just have it um, projected on the wall? It's, so I, I try to have some of the characters sitting watching the film and so this was the first Spirit Girls film. You can sit next to the character. And I think a lot of the, that came from my years of performing because to me it's very important to involve the audience in the emotional experience of a film. It's a different approach than a lot of artists typically take because it's sort of the um, current state of the art world is to um, make the work for yourself. But I, I think coming from a, a performance background, I. I, I do want to move people emotionally with my work, and I find film to be the, the most perfect way of doing that. Here's some of the costumes on the wall, the helmets from that film. A lot of, you see a lot of animal, this is all stuff you can get online. 
um, hunters, I guess they get these foam forms and they um, uh, stretch the skin. So it's also, it, there's, there's this element of melancholy and sadness to this work for me. Um, and here's the lead spirit girl being saved by the animals. Here's a, another group of monsters. Um, this was a film, I was given an opportunity to show a film in a mausoleum, which was really the crowning point of my career. And I was so happy because it, it really felt like the underworld. So I made a bunch of animals that I thought were, I kind of downgraded the, 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 um, the quality or, well not as much as the quality, it was sort of more like just more low key, um, uh, sort of naive costume making at that point. Uh, here's the lead girl played by me, of course, and the, her father who only eats yams. Here's the monster parade leading her to the world of monsters. Here's the mausoleum with it projected and then uh, I had a band, uh, my band play. The, at that point it was the Spare Girls in front doing the, the live score. I like to do live scores for my films whenever possible. And then here in the mausoleum uh, gallery, I had collages w w from uh, made fr uh, photographs of different um, cemeteries I had been to all over. And the people at the cemetery were nice enough to lend me the flowers that they had pulled off the graves of the people. You only get three or four days of flowers on the grave and then they take them away, which I thought was a little bit difficult for the, so they put them in here. So here's some of the characters in here. Here's one of the collages. Um, um, uh, it was a, a cemetery in London. Another cemetery, also in. Again, here's a, another challenge with shipping. I was given an opportunity to show in Lille um, with a very small shipping budget, so I sent the characters' heads, got the mannequins there, and created the whole installation on the spot with things uh, rented from um, thrift stores. I said I was no longer doing the Spirit Girls anymore, and then they said, well, um, could we show all the Spirit Girls films? And I said, well, sure, okay. Then I did thought, well, it'd be nice to do a, a dead Spirit Girl in the middle of the installation to sort of end that series. There's some of the characters, and the collages on the walls were already over there, so that was nice. We, we created a lot of the, the whole, the painting and the stenciling and everything on the spot. This is a show I did in Pittsburgh. Um, I sent the heads along and I got all the scarecrows uh, from th thrift stores in Pittsburgh and made these theatrical train um, flats and uh, with a soundtrack of, of free jazz noise playing with, with um, train noises. This is one of the most exciting projects for me because I got to go to a lot of different thrift stores with a pretty unlimited budget and buy a bunch of crap which is like heaven. <laughs> Here's some of the characters. And I create, uh, this was actually just two weeks there, so it was quite, quite a quick pace. <clears throat> okay, the Spirit Girls reemerge for one last time. This was Festival Supreme, which is a big festival. They do Jack Black the director does in uh, Los Angeles every year and um, he said that I could uh, he would pay for all the monsters if I would make them and if the spirit rules would play so after that brief negotiation I said sure so um, here's the the most recent monsters which I felt were just screaming to be in a full-length feature film so that's how they were born these are actually uh, latex heads that I adapted, filled with expanding foam and mounted on um, a bicycle helmet. So the actual head of the person wearing it is looking through the ascot in front, and the shoulders are actually fake shoulders. They're not real shoulders, they're foam. 
So these are quite tall. Here's the installation. I didn't do the entire installation, but I did the inside of the windmill. Um, it was rather dark. It's not a great photograph of that. Here's the monsters going for a ride on the train. They've gotten to go many places. It's pretty exciting. The costumes I, are sort of like caftans. I made all the co caftan costumes, and then I realized if someone stepped on the back of the caftan, the person's neck could be broken. So I switched over to this sort of capelet plan um, with a caftan underneath it. Here they are um, amongst the audience. Each one is hand painted, all of the, the costumes are hand painted. Here they are, they went to Geneva for that show. I did a series where I did a collage a day for 365 days and here they are mounted on the walls. Here's the farm room, some of the spirit girl collages before. Um, another spirit girls film, campfire song with the characters from the film. And here we see the ventriloquist dolls. Now they're back in their own bar room, just sitting there watching the movie. And then the Western song, uh, uh, the, another way to fill the space is these large flats. So I created a Western town with soundtracks, laughing, coming from the saloon, uh, different audio sounds throughout the whole exhibit. And I had, I think about eight of my films shown there in installations. So this, this went up very quickly, like in a week. Some of the circus collages. Now we're at the film that we're going to see tonight, The Day of Forevermore. Uh, uh, I had never really wanted to do a feature movie, but I thought, well, it's time I should do it. I had never done a movie where people actually talked. I had never done a movie where there was a script. And so I started with a lot of storyboards, and I wanted a Hieronymus Bosch feeling, and I wanted it to open with a tableau, like a Hieronymus Bosch tableau. So these, you'll see, are actually actors wearing the costumes, and, but they seem frozen in time in the introduction of the film. I play the mama um, witch, and my real-life daughter plays Luna, uh, the young witch. I'm trying to indoctrinate her into my cult because, uh, coven, that is, Freudian slip. Um, uh, at my coven of witches, because I'm tired, I've been doing it for 800 years, I really want to ride away on my devil and be done with it, but I have to trick her because she's got a pure, sweet soul, and she really um, does, she wants to leave the farm, she does not want to take over the coven. So, here I am with my friends. It's a little bit of an interesting relationship the mom has with the daughter. It's a, it's passive aggressive on her part to say the least and um, the daughter is naive but she ha it's a coming of age story she has to um, grow up and uh, and really find out who she is here she is she's still very lonely on the farm she's teaching the birds how to fly here's the coven in the bar scene the spirit girls will make a cameo in the bar playing some of the some of the spirit girls' music. Uh, the daughter Luna befriends some drug addicts in the drug den. And then here's the ritual scene where she is finally tricked by the mother, um, and the monsters gather around her and give her the magic cloak. This is where it was um, debuted in Los Angeles. Here's some of the monsters again walking around the theater. And a very beautiful theater from the 20s. Q&A. Q&A with monsters. Uh, this is my most recent big installation. I thought to myself what would happen to Luna when she left the farm eventually and she would come across this uh, pagan chapel, these broken stained glass trees, uh, waterfalls, sounds, and um, collages, and then the devil's ass sticking out of the wall, which will feature heavily in the film. 
you kind of get the feeling of a chapel. The different the, some of the monsters from the films were beheaded and made into totems. And the witch totem, with some smaller collages. Here's the devil pierced through the wall, one side and then his ass on the other. And then we got some church pews to show the film. Again, trying to create a feeling for the audience to get involved. Now my current project is to do 200 copies of the LP of the movie, of the soundtrack of the movie, each one a different cover. So I've been doing them with the, um, the surrealist technique of decalcomania, painting on glass, flipping it over, laying it down, and then going through my many bins of collage stuff and just gluing it on. And um, I allow 10 minutes per record. So that's what I'm involved in right now, and it's been quite fun. And I also, for fun, have a noise band. I thought it was um, nice to just collaborate with some people. This is uh, the noise band, F for Ake. Um, uh, play on the words, F for Fake, Orson Welles film, excellent film. I, here I am in my costume and the guys are in their costume. Well, I think that brings us up to date. So I'm very happy to present this movie. Is there any questions before we start? I know that's not quite what we planned on, but I thought maybe if it's on the top of your mind. No? Okay. Well, then we're going to show the movie. It's about an hour and 15 minutes, and enjoy. And we'll have a Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>
filmed over a course of four days, uh, one and one all-nighter in the in the bar scene. Um, it it was really challenging everything I had. The hardest part, I think, was the ritual scene. I, I, have a, I was teaching a film class, so the, the students are all um, the, the monsters, and so I had a great deal of help there, and some of the teachers helped me with the filming, the, the cinematographer, and then I traded artwork for um, the camera people. So I was really on a super low budget, and of course, that was a, a real challenge because I do did pay some of the people, the professionals, especially the people who had to light the bar scene. That was difficult. So um, I think the real challenge was working with so many people because up until that point I just worked with myself, and it was also like, in ma in many ways, it was like being a mom. People had um, like breakdowns and hissy fits and. So I think that was really the, the challenge, was keeping morale up, and the costumes were hot. It was, of course, it was some freaking heat wave in the middle of May in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, I think the hardest was just keeping morale up, and especially when you're working with volunteers, because I know there's a lot of filmmakers in here, and you help each other with your movies. And so I think the movie people and art people are a little bit different, because movie people do have more stamina, no offense, um, for, for these film projects, because a lot of my art students actually uh, kind of didn't show up. And, I mean, and nothing against art students, because I love art students, you know, but it's just more like, the, I, I don't know, the film students were, had the stamina and, and, and they knew what it would take, and so um, that was the most difficult thing. I think the barroom scene, was ultimately the most difficult because it was an all-nighter, and I think um, it, people really had lost a lot of um, in, in, incentive at that point. So, um, and then of course the challenges afterwards were the the get you know I had one editor and then he quit and then I had um, and then the color the color was very difficult. We had a really hard time with the color, and then the, the sound of, of course had its own challenges and so yeah ultimately I think I it, my next film I plan to just go the other way and do a, more of a self-portrait you know myself as an artist alone in the studio as a woman or something filmed by myself and just not have any crew because it's it, um, I, you know, it, was, it, it was like having this giant band of, of, uh, instead of just five people you have 30 people so yeah. Um, and also, in terms of structure, I was very influenced by Wizard of Oz. I thought it was great when you find out at the end that the, the characters in Wizard of Oz were actually like her dream state when she wakes up and she goes, Scarecrow, you were there, and you were there. And so I wanted the initial tableau of Avant to be um, sort of the same structure um, where you're presenting the characters and then they come to life. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering uh, on your strategy for writing the score, like how you managed that. Do you mostly do that part afterwards, like after the shooting, or? Oh yeah, definitely. Because yeah. I had a lot of songs that I had thought would fit in different parts, and then the more moody yeah. stuff I would do on my synthesizer or guitar and, and fill it in afterwards. But it was definitely I always do the music last, and then. The script, I was actually thinking of just having all the actors do improv, and then it was my daughter, Luna, who in, um, in, in real life, Colette, she said, no, you have to have a script. Actors really need something to go by. They can riff on it. And so I was, so, so then I sat down and I just wrote the whole thing, and I wanted it to be sort of an archaic language, as if they had never, um, you know, she had never left. And, then I was lucky enough to come upon the ranch. It was a um, an artist, an old man artist who had died and left it to his kids. And when I was shooting the film, I heard so many stories. Like you know, when you when the drone we did the drone footage and you fly over, I noticed that like the toilets were all together and the bricks were all together and the concrete was all together and all the scrap metal was all together. And the son said. Oh, my dad made us all do that. He, you know, he was always making us try to organize the, the, 
the crap around here. And, and um, so then I invited the son and his daughter over to see the film in my studio. And he was looking at the footage of the bus, and he said, oh, we used to bring kids up to the, to the ranch on that bus and give them art classes. And then he said to his daughter, oh, we should get that bus going again. And then I realized Forevermore Acres was safe. It was not going <laughs> to change. It was always going to be there for, for all time until something else happened. So. Oh, oh, okay. Could you talk about the sequence? Like what was the first scene? What was uh, the first scene filmed was the tableau of the font, and I was, I thought I'll shoot the first 15 minutes and then show it around, try to get a grant, try to show it to people, tell them my idea, try to get some money, and that um, didn't really prove fruitful. So then I <coughs> spent nine months working on planning of the rest of the film and new costumes and script and everything, and then it was just sort of like, well, I'm just going to, you know, beg, borrow, steal, trade, work to do the rest. And so the ritual scene was shot first. I knew that we should use the good camera because we only got the good camera for one day, and so then the different formatting came, um, like the, the Super 8, the 16 and all that, it kind of fell into place. Question back there. Yeah. Hi. Um, <coughs> the beginning, you, you, you talk about subconscious. Yeah, the subconscious. And, yeah, and somehow the monster is a, a gate for you, like to reach uh, subconscious somehow? The, yeah, the dream state. Mm. Um, I, well, while I was watching the movie, I, there was this sign saying to me, like, um, this is a fake, like, costume, the monster and the are fake. Um, the act actor, they are acting, so they are, it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's fake. Right. Um, yeah, and, and, like, it's, yeah. I think that's what makes it an art film, though. I think it's different from an independent film. You know you're looking at people in costumes. It, part of my also reasoning was I didn't want my mouth to move. I wanted it to just be this weird mask. Oh, wait, yeah. so, so my question is, like, how, how do you value fakeness as a quality to reach consciousness? Oh, that's a good question. The question was, how do you value fakeness to reach um, uh, the subconscious? So mm. I think that fakeness especially in nature, um, because there's like fake fire, there's like fake trees, there's fake rocks, there's fake um, leaves. Um, there's clearly, she wasn't speaking. I think that that kind of creates this poetic openness that you can um, reminisce and you think back. It becomes almost like an internal monologue instead of this is my narr narrative, and I'm not even asking the people to get swept up in this real story because it's not a real story. It's it's a po poetic narrative, and so I think the fakeness helps. Pe it, like sometimes, if you walk in and you see, oh, that the that bouquet of flowers is actually fake, it creates an emotional, like, kind of uneasiness in you. And so that's part of it, was that I wanted the emotional uneasiness. I wasn't really trying for reality. Okay, well thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. If you have any questions, you can always come up afterwards, ask um, independently. And good luck with all of your projects and your filmmaking and Th art making. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you. Thank you.